Numbers don't lie. 71 things you need to know about the world. Fourth part. Countries. Nations in the age of globalization. The First World War's extended tragedies. Few recent 100-year anniversaries resonated so loudly as November 2018's marking of the end of the world's first truly global armed conflict. The war's enormous carnage scarred the memory of a generation, but its most tragic legacy was the resulting communist rule in Russia, 1917, fascist rule in Italy, 1922, and Nazi rule in Germany, 1933. Those developments led to the Second World War, which killed even more people and left direct and indirect legacies, including NATO versus Russia, and a divided Korea, that still trouble our lives. The Battle of the Somme, 1916, British troops and Mark I tank Even though the Second World War was deadlier, a case can be made that the First War constituted the critical disaster, as it gave rise to so much of what followed. True. The Second War deployed far greater advances in destructive power, including the fastest fighter planes ever powered by reciprocating engines, enormous four-engine bombers, the B-17, missiles, the German V-1 and V-2, and, at the war's very end, the nuclear bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In comparison, the First World War, with its entrenched and barely shifting fronts, was a decidedly less dynamic conflict. But a closer look shows that purely technical advances were indeed critical for lengthening its duration and adding to its death toll. Leaving aside the use of poisonous gases in combat, never repeated on such a scale, several key modes of modern warfare were developed and even perfected during the earlier conflict. The first diesel-powered submarines were used on long forays to attack convoys of merchant ships. The first tanks were deployed in combat. The first bombing raids, using both dirigibles and airplanes, were mounted. The first battle-ready aircraft carrier was launched in 1914. The French successfully tested portable transmitters enabling voice communication from the air to the ground in 1916, and from air to air in 1917, beginning the long road toward ever smaller, ever more usable electronic components. But amid all these developments, we must single out the momentous innovation that allowed a blockaded Germany to endure its two-front war for four years, the synthesis of ammonia. When the war began, the British Navy cut Germany off from imports of chili nitrates, needed to produce explosives. But thanks to a remarkable coincidence, Germany could instead supply itself with homemade nitrates. In 1909, Fritz Haber, a professor at the University of Karlsruhe had ended the long-running quest for synthesizing ammonia from its elements. Nitrogen and hydrogen were combined under high pressure and in the presence of a catalyst, to make ammonia, NH3. By October, 1913, BASF, then the world's leading chemical conglomerate, under the leadership of Karl Bosch, had commercialized the process at the world's first ammonia plant, in a pot in Germany. This synthetic ammonia was to be used in the production of such solid fertilizers as sodium or ammonium nitrate. See the world without synthetic ammonia. P. 221. But the war began less than a year later, and instead of converting ammonia into fertilizer, BASF began to mass produce the compound for conversion into nitric acid to be used in the synthesis of wartime explosives. A larger ammonia plant was completed by April 1917 in Luna, west of Leipzig, and the combined production of the two plants sufficed to support Germany's manufacture of explosives until the war's end. The new capability of industry to find ways around every shortage helped to drag out the First World War, adding millions of casualties. This terrifyingly modern development belies the war's primitive image framed as it so often is by prolonged stalemates and muddy trenches, and it paved the way to even greater carnage a generation later. Is the U.S. really exceptional? Belief in American exceptionalism that unique blend of ideals, ideas, and love of liberty made so powerful by great technical and economic accomplishments, is alive and well. Even former President Obama, the man known for his unemotional approach to governing and hence a reluctant endorser to begin with, has come around. Early in his presidency, 
In April 2009, he affirmed his belief by essentially denying it, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. By May of 2014, he had relented, I believe in American exceptionalism with every fibre of my being. But such proclamations mean nothing if they cannot stand up to the facts. And here, what really matters is not the size of a country's gross domestic product or the number of warheads or patents it may possess, but the variables that truly capture its citizens' physical and intellectual well-being. These variables are simply life, death, and knowledge. Infant mortality is an excellent proxy for a wide range of conditions, including income, quality of housing, nutrition, education, and investment in healthcare. Very few babies die in those affluent countries where people live in good housing and where well-educated parents, themselves well-nourished, feed their children properly and have access to medical care, see the best indicator of quality of life. Tier Y Infant Mortality, P. 8. So how does the United States rank among the world's roughly 200 nations? The latest available comparison shows that with 6 of every 1,000 live-born babies dying in the first year of life, the U.S. does not figure among the top 25 nations. Its infant mortality is far higher than in France, 4, Germany, 3, and Japan, 2. And the U.S. rate was 50% higher than in Greece, 4, a country portrayed in the press as an utter basket case ever since the financial crisis. Excusing that very poor rating by saying that the European countries have homogenous populations does not work, modern, France and Germany are full of recent immigrants, just spent some time in Marseille or Dusseldorf. What matters more is parental knowledge, good nutrition, the extent of economic inequality, and access to universal health care, the United States being, notoriously, the only modern affluent country without the latter and looking at the journeys and gives an almost identically poor result, recent, U.S. life expectancy, nearly 79 years for both sexes, does not even rank among the top two dozen countries worldwide, and is, again, behind Greece, about 81, as well as South Korea, nearly 83. Canadians live more than three years longer on average in Japanese about 84, nearly six years longer as compared to their U.S. counterparts. Educational achievements of U.S. students, or lack thereof, are scrutinized with every new edition of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA. The latest results, 2018, for 15-year-olds show that, in math, the United States ranks just below Russia. Slovakia, and Spain, but far lower than Canada, Germany, and Japan. In science, U.S. school children place just below the mean PISA score, 497, versus 501, in reading, they are barely above it, 498 versus 496 and they are far behind all the populous, affluent Western nations. PISA, like any such study, has its weaknesses. But large differences in relative rankings are clear, there is not even a remote indication of any exceptional U.S. educational achievements. American readers might find those facts discomforting, but there is nothing arguable about them. In the United States, babies are more likely to die and high schoolers are less likely to learn than their counterparts in other affluent countries. Politicians may look far and wide for evidence of American exceptionalism but they won't find it in the numbers, where why Europe should be more pleased with itself on January 1, 1958, Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and the Federal Republic of Germany jointly formed the European Economic Community, EEC, with the aim of economic integration and free trade within a customs union. Although the immediate goals were explicitly economic, the EEC's aspirations were always far higher. In the founding document, the Treaty of Rome, the member states declared their determination to lay the foundations of an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe and to ensure the economic and social progress of their countries by common action to eliminate the barriers which divide Europe. At that time, 
these goals seemed to be quite unrealistic. Europe was divided not only by national prejudices and economic inequalities but also, most fundamentally, by the Iron Curtain, which ran from the Baltic to the Black Sea, with Moscow controlling the nations to the east of it. That Soviet control was reasserted after the failure of the Prague Spring in 1968, as the attempted Czechoslovak reforms ended in the Soviet invasion of the country, while the EEC continued to accept new members, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Denmark in 1973, Greece in 1981, Spain and Portugal in 1986. And then, after the USSR, collapsed in 1991, the way was open to pan-European integration. In 1993, the Maastricht Treaty established the European Union. In 1999, a common currency, the euro, was created, and 27 nations now belong to the Union. The EU has just over 500 million people, less than 7% of the global population, but it generates nearly 24% of the world's economic output, as against 22% for the United States. It accounts for nearly 16% of global exports of goods, a third more than the United States, including cars, airliners, pharmaceuticals, and luxury goods. Moreover, half of its 27 members are among the top 30 countries in terms of quality of life, as measured by the United Nations Human Development Index. And yet, today, the EU is witnessing mounting worries and disaffection. The bonds of union are loosening, and, the UK has left outright. Within Europe, the commentariat offers endless explanations of this new centrifugal temper, the excessive bureaucratic control exercised from Brussels, the reassertion of national sovereignty, and poor economic and political choices, notably the adoption of a common currency without common fiscal responsibility. I must confess that I am puzzled. As somebody who was born, during Nazi occupation, who grew up on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, and whose family history is typical of Europe's often complicated national and linguistic origins, I see today's Europe, shortcomings in all, as a staggering outcome, too good to be believed. Surely these achievements are worthy of redoubled efforts at compromises to reunite it. Instead, decades of peace and prosperity have, been taken for granted, and lapses and difficulties, some inevitable, some unpardonable, have served to reignite old biases and animosities. My wish for Europe, make it work. The failure to do so cannot be contemplated lightly. Brexit, realities that matter most will not change. What will really be different in the post-Brexit UK? Of course, much has already changed during the unexpectedly, protracted run-up to the event and what has taken place can be best described by using the words the English language gained thanks to the last successful invasion of those isles. The country has been through a disorienting period of accusations, acrimony, condemnations, delusions, falsifications, illusions, recriminations, and tested civility. But what will really change five or ten years down the road, as far as the fundamental determinants of the nation's life are concerned? First things first. We all have to eat, and modern societies have been extraordinarily successful in supplying an unprecedented variety of foodstuffs at a generally affordable cost. We have to energize our buildings, our industries, and our transport by incessant flows of fuel and electricity. We have to produce and renew the material foundations of our societies by manufacturing, building, and maintenance. And we need adequate infrastructures, schools, health, and elderly care, to educate people and to care for them in sickness and old age. Everything else is secondary. On all of these scores the accounts are clear. The UK has not been self-sufficient in food production for a few centuries, and, its dependency on imports has doubled from about 20% in the early 1980s to 40% in recent years and in the short term nothing short of draconian food rationing, and no fresh produce in winter, can significantly reduce this import dependence. Three quarters of British food imports come from the EU, but Spanish vegetable growers and Danish bacon producers will remain as eager to ship, 
their products as the British consumers will be to buy them, and hence there will be no demand destroying taxes or pricing. The last time the UK was a net exporter of energy, oil and gas from the North Sea, was in 2003, and in recent years the country has been importing 30-40% to 40 of its primary energy, natural gas above all. Again, no major shifts will take place in the near future, and the well-supplied global energy market will assure the continuation of affordable import prices. The UK, once the unrivaled inventor and pioneer of modern science-based manufacturing, it is the country of Michael Faraday, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, James Clerk Maxwell and Charles Algernon Parsons, after all is already more deindustrialized than Canada, historically the least industrialized Western nation. In 2018, Manufacturing accounted for 9% of the British GDP, compared to 10% in Canada, 11% in the US, and, respectively, 19, 21, and 27% in such remaining manufacturing superpowers as Japan, Germany, and South Korea. And 32% in Ireland, whose share now beats even China's 29%. Yet, again, no overnight switch in political arrangements can turn this, historic tide. Much as in the rest of Europe, the UK's modern education provision has put excessive stress on quantity over quality, its healthcare system labours under many much-studied constraints, easily illustrated by a stream of reports about overwhelmed National Health Service employees and overburdened hospitals, and its ageing population will require more resources. The country's old age Dependency ratio, number of people 65 and older as a share of all economically active people 20 to 64 years of age, standing at 32% in 2020, still slightly lower than in France or Germany, will increase to 47% by the year 2050. No governmental intervention and no declaration of regained sovereignty and severance from the bureaucrats of Brussels will have any effect on this inexorable process. Given these fundamental realities, a rational observer must wonder what tangible differences, what clear benefits could any reassertion of British insularity bring. False claims can be painted on buses, extravagant promises are easy to make, feelings of pride or satisfaction may become fleetingly convincing, but none of those intangibles can change what the UK has become, an aging nation. A deindustrialized and worn out country whose per capita GDP is now just over half of the Irish mean, something that Swift, Gladstone, or Churchill would find utterly unfathomable. Another has been power whose claim to uniqueness rests on having too many troubled princes and on exporting costs. <laughs>